Ah, lucky man, lucky man, lucky man. I actually met George Beopor. I, I met him on the elevator. And I fell in love with him on the elevator when I heard him laugh. I was going down on a Monday morning to work in a very grouchy mood, and I said something about the elevator, which is always breaking down. And George laughed with the He said, ah, ha, ha, that's funny. And all of a sudden, I just warmed up, and the whole day seemed very beautiful. And I said, that man has the most wonderful laugh in the world. And I had no idea who he was and didn't meet him again for two months, where I met him down at the good old El Quixote bar downstairs. <laughs> at, at which point, he immediately asked me to come up and uh, see his uh, jungle, not his etchings. <laughs> My uh, biggest theatrical success in New York was a story about a cockroach and a nolly cat in the Hitterville, and here she is. You see, Mehitable is always being scolded by Archie the cockroach because he wants her to, tame, to turn into a nice, tame house cat. And Mehitable says, oh, Archie, why do I want to be a tame house cat? And uh, I have my problems, and I don't try to change you. Why do you try to change me? He said, don't change me, Archie. And this is the story of my life in all of our lives. Everyone's always trying to change us. And Mahidable sings, My youth I shall never forget. And there's nothing I really regret. The years I have poured down the drain have sparkled like golden champagne. I don't care to dance with a king. <laughs> But with any old beggar, I'll sing. I'll dance in the sun or the shade to any old tune that is played. It's cheerio, my deario, friends and pirouette. It's cheerio, my deario, there's life in me yet. Touche gay, touche gay, touche gay, touche gay, touche gay, touche gay. Your I'll sing all my troubles away. Well, the very first time I ever came here, I think I only stayed five days and there was a robbery and a fire and a murder. I came here to try to become a resident alien. That's my fundamental. I've had my photograph taken, and I've filled in the forms, and now I can't do any more except wait. All people who come back to England from America, the first thing they say is, it's more like the movies than you'd ever dream. And it is. Well, the moment I saw New York, I wanted it. Apart from the beauty of the place, in New York, there are no strangers. People warned me that I would be robbed with violence, and I don't know whether this is so or not. But I can safely say that all the people who are not hitting you over the head are your friends. They talk to you in the street. They turn back, having passed you, in order to say, welcome to America. Can't ask for more than that. First of all, I unpack. And I unpack quickly because almost all my luggage is bottles. And it's bottles of witch hazel, and it's bottles of peroxide, and it's bottles of this, that, and the other. And one is terrified that they will have broken. Most of all, one is terrified that the dye with which I do my hair will have broken. In that case, everything in the suitcase would be bright purple forever. Style, as I would define it, is never, of course, elegance. It is simply an idiom which arises spontaneously from you, and everybody has an individuality. And all you have to do is to learn how to present it, because you've nothing else to give the world which no one else can give except yourself.
of all the cities I've ever visited, the one most totally given over to the idea of success is New York. All those people down there are either hurrying or sauntering toward what they call the big time. And if my voice were loud enough, I would now shout down to them to explain that all they need is to have a lifestyle of their very own. And it's appropriate that I should be standing on this balcony to discuss this matter, because this is the hotel where the great stylists have lived. Also, when Brendan Bean stayed here, he was rather outrageous. I don't know if anybody knows who he was. He wrote a play called The Borstal Boy, and he was rather a drunk, so they say. And he used to stand in the halls and holler up through the staircases. He used to like to hear the echo of the hollering. Oh! And love to hear the echoes. I guess you could probably hear you. Hello there! That kind of thing. This is one of the tenants coming down. And uh, he also had a habit of chasing chambermaids, I understand. Uh, he was a rather licentious man. And finally got to the point that all the late, the chambermaids, when they were going to straighten up his room, they made sure that he was completely dressed. They got him sort of a bit of an exhibitionist. Well, I don't know what to say, except I absolutely must decline to dance in the streets where Gertrude Stein. And as for Alice B. Chocolas, I'd sooner Shakespeare and a great big box of chocolates. She, she said when she was dying, what is the answer? But then she said, what is the question? I will give you a golden ball to hop with the children in the hall if you'll marry, 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 if you'll marry me. I will give you the keys of my chest and all the money that I possess if you'll marry, 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 if you'll marry me. Brendan was in New York, was being thrown out of one hotel after another and just wasn't able to write. And Bernard, who I have known from other writers and from other poets, called me up and said, Stanley, I wonder if you can help me out. We have a real problem with Brendan Bean. I'm sure you're aware of what's happening with him in his life. And I said, I, I really am. I'll tell you, uh, Bernard, I don't know if we can manage that. Because what I hear about him and what I read about him, he's in a sad, sad shape. He says, would you do me a favor and give it a shot? I mean, if there's any place he could possibly put himself together would be at the Chelsea. Would you do me a favor? And I reluctantly, because reluctantly, because he really was in the papers almost every other day, getting in trouble with the police, with the, with just a lot of different people. I said, okay. I will give you a watch and chain to show the children in the lane. If you'll marry, 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 if you'll marry me. Brendan thought that he could not have children, that his wife was impotent. His wife could not conceive. His wife thought he was impotent and he couldn't conceive. No one knew what the situation was, but his wife came over. Bernard Geis brought his wife over and wanted to make his life sort of a homey type atmosphere to finish these last two books. Beatrice spent one year here, and the ironic part about it is she conceived here in the hotel. And I always shocked and kidded Brendan about it. You see, the Chelsea is so creative, we can do these miracles. Is that the shopper can use this place as a place to rest. The lady could be shopping at Altman's or Bombatelli's, because this is the height of the shopping district. It was where the Ladies' Mile was, and where Cooper Spiegel's was. And they could stop here for a breath of fresh air. Okay, now we're gonna go to one of the many floors. We're gonna work our way down, and we'll talk about the people on the floors. On this floor, at one time, uh, Brendan Bean lived, and Virgil Thompson lives on this floor right now. I'm sure you've all heard of Virgil Thompson. In fact, there was a spread about his apartment not long ago in the New York Times. 